I'm very excited to have a very special guest on the podcast today for Rights for Women. Joanna Penn is an award-nominated New York Times and USA Today best-selling thriller author under the name J.F. Penn. She also writes non-fiction for authors and is widely known for her brilliant podcast, The Creative Pen, which has been downloaded over 4 million times in 220 countries. Joanna has written over 30 titles and sold more than 600,000 books in 149 countries and six languages. She's an indie author and an international professional speaker an award-winning creative entrepreneur. She's based in Bath, England, and lived in Australia and New Zealand for 11 years, which I'm going to chat to her briefly about. She's turned her love of travel into a newish podcast called Books and Travel, and spent 13 years as a business IT consultant in large corporates across the globe, before becoming a full-time author entrepreneur in September 2011. She has a new book out called Your Author Business Plan, which is mainly what I'm going to be talking to her about today. I was a huge fan of the Creative Pen podcast, even before I published my own first indie book. So it's an absolute pleasure to be able to welcome Joanna to the podcast today. Jo, welcome to the Rights for Women Convert Couch. Oh, thanks so much, Pamela. It's exciting to be here. And uh, yeah, I always, I, I hear my introduction. I'm like, really? Seriously, is that me? But of course, when I was living back in Brisbane, back in the day before I had any books at all. And so it's kind of crazy. It's lovely to be talking to you over in Australia. It is. It's great. It's evening here. And of course, quite early in the day over there for you in the UK. And I'm pretty sure you're still in lockdown over there. Is that right? Yes, lockdown three, uh, oh. which which you never know could be our last lockdown. But uh, I think now we're we're quite we know how to do it, and uh, you know you've got all your things. It, desperate to get out of here, obviously, but mm. it's it's fine. And me and my husband both work from home anyway, and ha have done for years, so it doesn't make too much difference to our our daily uh, life. Yeah, I suppose it puts a dent in your travel plans. <laughs> that is the thing that's the, that is the big thing but it's funny we were talking because my husband's a New Zealander and uh, so of course we we uh, we get his mum phoning up and I think uh, the news over there makes it look like it's the apocalypse over here like bodies lying in the it streets does. and everything yeah but that's just the news and it's uh, it's the media I, I mean from our perspective it we you know, we wear masks in shops and, uh, well, when they're open, they're not open right now. Uh, but I would say it's uh, sensationalised too many in many ways, which is what the news does. Um, but in right. terms of our da daily life, um, you know, we, we go for walks, we go to the supermarket and uh, obviously there's some terrible things happening, but it's not like everyone in their daily life is uh, is having an awful time I mean obviously again a lot of bad stuff but it, it don't feel like the whole country is <laughs> sort of oh, dying good. yeah <laughs> you're right it is the sort of news we're getting here and like you say of course it isn't great but yeah it's mm. good to know that you know well you're still smiling and and life's oh, still yeah. going and on <laughs> relatively exactly. normally <laughs> Yeah, and I think with the vaccine rollout now, uh, my mum should be getting it soon. And then it will, I, I mean, I'm i am a very happy, upbeat, positive person anyway. So I've always got hope for the future. And what I would say is, and again, the terrible death toll around the world, but the uh, advances in, in medical you know, technology are, mm. have been incredible. So what we could find is that this period uh, will enable a lot of breakthroughs that will help all of us in the future. And so I try and stay on that side, the silver lining in the pandemic. Um, personally, it's been a very creative time for me. And I think for many writers, once you get over the initial, oh my goodness, the world is gonna end. Yeah. <laughs> once you get over that phase, which we kind of got over last March, like Mar March, April, um, I feel like we have to look at the silver linings and it, even down to, and this comes back to our conversation today, what is important to do with your life because we've all mm. come face to face with our mortality in such a dramatic way that we're now feeling like do I really want to do that or for people who are may maybe haven't written their first book yet now's a really good time because you know you kind of like yeah life is short I don't know when it's going to end and what do I want to actually achieve with my life what body of work can I create that I'm proud of mm. and that has definitely 
those of us over here who've kind of been in this a lot longer um, feel that very strongly is I must only do the things that are really important now. Yeah, I love that glass completely full approach. Yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> I, I, obviously, with acknowledging that there's a lot of pain and suffering, but I, I yeah. try and just stay up, stay upbeat. Otherwise, it would be very depressing. <laughs> true, true. It's a great attitude. So, Joe, for those who are listening who might not be familiar with your work, could you tell us a little bit more? You know, add to that intro about yourself and your streams of writing related work and even if there's a little bit you can tell us about your time in Australia that would be great. Sure well I will I'll start with Australia because I uh, I have a degree in theology which is one of those completely pointless degrees and then I went into um, IT consulting so I ended up uh, implementing accounts payable in various co uh, companies around the world and in 2005 I found myself in Brisbane Australia working with a very large mining company <laughs> so uh -huh. we won't mention the name but no. I was, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, Australia mining, you know, big company. Yep. And so I was there and I've been doing this job for years. I'd resigned several times over the years. I started a scuba diving business in Northland in New Zealand. I tried property investing. We had um, a do up in Ipswich in Queensland. <laughs> and, you know, but, I, but none of these things stuck for me. I was like, do you know what? I'm just, I just, I don't want to do those things. And I just didn't know what to do with my life. So this was like 2005, 2000 six and we were living in Ipswich as I said and I was like do you know what I'm just gonna figure out what I need to do with my life I'm just miserable in my job um they were paying me really well as a contractor but I was crying at work you know I was mm. just miserable and so I started to listen to a lot of self-help, read a lot of books. And I was like, do you know what? I'm going to write a book uh, about career change. And that will help me figure out what I'm going to do with my life. And so I, I did write, write that book. I had a different name originally. Um, and then I decided, I looked at the publishing industry in Australia. So this was 2006. And I was like, do you know what? I don't want to do that because it's going to take years for this book to come out. And I'm not willing to wait that long. So uh, I said, self-published that first book in 2008, beginning of 2008. And I discovered that uh, you had to learn about marketing in order to actually sell some books. So that's, and I got on um, Current Affair and I got into, you know, lots of uh, Australian oh. papers and things. It was around the time when they had that dream job on the island in the- Oh, uh, I remember great... that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I was on TV talking about, if you don't get your, that dream job, you can get a different dream job. And oh, so I perfect. got, you know, I, yeah, I had all this traditional media and I literally sold a hundred books. <laughs> <laughs> which, which was hilarious. So, um, to, so I just decided to start uh, to, to investigate how you could use the internet to uh, sell books. And uh, I met, uh, well, I listened to some other Australians. So Yarrow Starak, who now is at yarrow.blog, uh, who was also Brisbane originally, and uh, Darren Rouse at Pro Blogger, who's in Melbourne. So mm -hmm. I was like, wow, these guys are making money on the internet, blogging, writing, basically. So I'm going to try that too. So I started my blog, The Creative Pen. Uh, I started um, a podcast. And then at that point, and I'm, I'm kind of giving a bit of context, because I know a lot of people are just starting out. So it, it was yeah. like I had this I had this book, but um, I also joined National Speakers Association in Brisbane, um, was speaking, started doing workshops at the library, Brisbane Library. Uh, my first self-publishing workshops were at Brisbane Library uh, all those oh, years ago. Okay. And eventually taught at the Queensland Library as well. And this was back in the day before really the kin before the International Kindle took off mm. in Australia, before print on demand was a thing before digital audio. So it was very hard back then to make any money with your books. Um, but I learned all this stuff. And then 2010, I did Year of the Novel uh, at Queensland Library. And, uh, you know, I know you've taught at that. So yes, that yeah. really helped me write my first novel. So I published my first novel in 2011. And essentially, what I did was design this sort of portfolio career so I could leave my job and I left my job in September 2011 as he said and but I took a massive pay cut so okay. it then took about four years uh, so we downsized we sold our house and our investment property we completely got rid of our debt we moved to a rental in Indrapilly uh, at the time and um, eventually moved back to the UK so I 
I left my job knowing that we had to downsize and take this pay cut. But then four years, four years later, 2015, I hit six figures the following year, multi six figures. And now I make far more money than I ever did mm. as uh, an IT consultant. But the reason to sort of give you that perspective is that it's, <laughs> as we speak now in 2021, this is like 15 years after yeah. I started writing yeah. that first book. But what I've done over 15 years literally is uh, write most days, um, p- publish. So put something into the world, whether that's a blog post, a podcast, uh, a, a book, um, keep improving my craft keep connecting with people uh, I, I, I have never had a moment of breakthrough success it's just been um, year after year but I love what I do I absolutely love it and I have never been weeping in the bathroom like I did <laughs> back at the mining company <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that's what's so brilliant. Is, is, and now things are incredible and things are getting even better for authors. Every single year, there are more opportunities to make money with our intellectual property assets, which is what we think of as books. <laughs> uh, yes, and yeah, yeah the, the ways that we can reach people, reach readers, the ways that we can be creative. I mean, look at, you know, the po- podcasting industry since I started mm. in two, uh, 2009 as has just exploded um so yeah I would I would just encourage people to think yes I mean I started a long time ago but literally there wasn't even the Kindle so things have really it's hard to imagine now isn't it you know you sort of like you say there's been so many changes have taken place in that time period oh since you started and and so Joe for you you know you are an indie author, you're loud and proud about that. You always have been. You've got the podcast, as you, you've just told us about all the different ways in which you've, you know, expanded your own career and your own portfolio of writing work. You have got a pretty firm finger on the pulse of the industry, and you do talk to a lot of people in the industry constantly as part of your work. And so, from your perspective, what do you think have been the major changes in writing and publishing over that time, and maybe particularly in the last few years? Oh, goodness. There's been so many. I mean, probably the biggest one and the pandemic has accelerated this more than ever is the adoption of digital reading. So what we found, uh, it it has been growing and growing. I mean, talking of, I mean, ebooks, obviously the US, the UK and to some extent Australia and Canada, but Australia and Canada are very small markets, uh, Mm. which is actually when I was in Australia, I was like, there is absolutely no point in me trying to make a lot of money in Australia. What I should do is aim for America so that was just a mindset shift that I had okay. like very quickly in Australia was it's 20 million people 25 million in um whereas sort of what 600 million in um I think so uh, America Something, and in the UK yeah. 70 million so you have to think about the size of the market but yeah in terms of the way publishing digital publishing has changed. And when I say digital, we're not just talking about eBooks. So uh, eBooks print on demand, which is if people don't know, you upload your print files and then um, that one copy is printed and sent to the customer after they have ordered it. So you don't have to do upfront costs, digital audio. So through your phone um, and that's been transformative. So I'd say the technology has Mm. been around now for a decade but the adoption of the technology is just speeding up, especially in other markets around the world. So, uh, for example, even since um, you downloaded my uh, introduction there, um, I, I've now sold books in more countries. So it's up. To I was like wondering 100... about that as I was yeah. reading it, actually. <laughs> It's like 159 countries now where I have sold books because they are available. And most of those are, you know, um, read on 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 the phone Um, or they are listened to on one of the apps. Library adoption of digital has just taken off in the last year because, of course, libraries haven't been open. So those libraries that were slow in adopting things like Overdrive, which you can get in your libraries in Australia, um, are now just starting to really take off uh, countries that have not really adopted digital or, or even ordering print online has just obviously it boomed because in the US, Europe, the UK, a lot of countries around the world, physical bookstores have been closed. So people mm. are now starting to buy more books online in every format. And that absolutely 
means that it's a level playing field because the hardest thing to do for an author is to get their books into a bookstore <laughs> even if you're traditionally published it might only yes. be in there for a month or a couple of months and then it's gone again so what the the beauty of you know having having your books and having the rights to distribute your books we can talk about that in, in a bit is that you can uh, reach people all over the world in these different formats and so that's probably the biggest shift is the way technology has been uh, adopted I'd also say that the industry itself has started to change and a lot more authors are doing what I would call a, hy a hybrid approach mm. which is is the word now um I think you're probably I'm hybrid, hybrid yeah. yeah yeah which now. means you yeah. have some traditional deals and some independent deals it used to be that it was either or like back in the day it was like oh you were only traditionally publishing or you're only uh self-publishing but now it's not like that at all like I've I've licensed my rights in foreign currencies uh, foreign currency <laughs> foreign languages <laughs> um and yeah get paid in foreign currency yeah, um yeah. so yeah so you can do both now uh you know very famous examples like The Martian by Andy Weir which was yeah. self-published as an ebook got an audiobook deal and then went on to obviously get a traditional book deal and uh, incredibly well uh, now with the movie and his second book uh, traditionally published and then people like Brandon Sanderson is a huge fantasy author who had recently just in December 2020 or November he did a kickstarter and raised 6.7 million dollars for a reprint of his first novel in a special edition and what he is traditionally published for most of his rights but he retained the rights for special editions so he did a limited edition leather bound you know custom wow. art and raised 6.7 million so and he's a very big name uh, traditionally published yes. author so what i would say to people is the, it's really the world has just really changed in terms of the opportunities and the attitudes it's more like you are an empowered creator and you get to choose the way your work reaches people so for example you might choose to work with an Australian publisher for print publishing in Australia New Zealand only and then you might decide to self-publish your own ebooks globally because you can have them in 190 countries you might decide to retain your audiobook rights and do those yourself and you might keep print on demand for all other territories and then you're a, a hybrid author making uh, different streams of income from one book and I think that's the smart author approach mm. now it's this kind of selective rights licensing and understanding that you do create intellectual property assets and that you are in charge of your career so it's it's this idea of empowerment around the creator which we're just seeing more and more of in every uh, sphere of art as people artists realize that it would be better for them to reach customers directly than just rely on these um, middlemen as such yeah and as you say it's so important to have that control of your intellectual property and that's been a really big thing that's impacted on me in listening to your podcast is is how much you are really keen about people hanging on to their intellectual property well it's not about hanging on to it it's about understanding the value mm. of it and then licensing where appropriate so when I've obviously I've come over and spoken uh, spoken at Queensland Library since yeah. uh, I, I left and hopefully we'll come back at some point when we're allowed back into your country yes, <laughs> um, <please>. but, <laughs> but it's funny because I I definitely think that you uh, need to just understand what you're signing so for example mm. I've talked to uh, Rebecca Giblin who's been on my podcast from the University of Melbourne one of the universities in Melbourne talking about this the the contracts that come out of the publishing industry might say something like worldwide English or even worldwide all languages all formats existing now and to be created for the life of copyright and people are just signing this for a couple of thousand dollars and what that means is you literally yes you created the book and the copyright is you own it, it but you do not control that anymore yeah. for 70 years after you die you've literally just signed you've basically signed it away you don't have any rights left in that book and people will go oh well the publisher will just do the best for me won't they um no because publishers <laughs> 
actually work in territories. So even if you sign that contract with an Australian publisher, are they going to publish your ebook in 190 countries? It's very unlikely that they will. Will your audiobook be available in libraries in the UK? It's very unlikely because mm. publishers work in these silos of territories, whereas we can publish globally in all formats. So I'm not I'm absolutely not saying that you shouldn't license your rights. Yeah. You yep. should you license your rights where it makes sense, but you just need to look at the contract. So if an Australian publisher says, uh, here's the contract with that clause for everything, you're like, okay, I'm not going to sign for all formats existing now and to be invented. That just isn't fair. Mm. <laughs> so for example, how about we do print only in Australia, New Zealand for English for the next 10 years? <laughs> there's, yeah. there's an alternative yeah. clause for you. <laughs> so I, I, think, I think it's just about, and again, this comes down to empowerment mm -hmm. and understanding your value. I feel that so many authors are like, oh, someone picked me. Someone thinks my book is good. So yes, I'll sign whatever you give yeah, me. Yeah, that's so true. But, Exactly. But what you find, and you know this, because you've got six, six, seven books, something like yeah. that, you know, now. And so you and you'll meet authors, the most disappointed authors are the ones who signed these deals. And then a couple of years later, realize it's not all it's cracked up to be. So what I would say is, yes, license your rights, but be very specific and understand uh, that this is your career and you have to manage it. Yeah, yep, for sure. Great advice. So, Joe, you write both fiction and nonfiction. Do you think that publishing nonfiction books, you know, in, in a particular area of expertise is helpful for a fiction author in terms of then selling their fiction books? Uh, I don't know if it's helpful for selling your fiction books. It depends what it is. So, for example, I am slowly working on a sort of travel memoir which may or may not be interesting to readers of my fiction what mm. what tends to happen with readers of fiction is they're pretty loyal to their genres um you know a lot of fiction readers only read within specific genres even within my audience i write an action adventure series my arcane series and some of those readers will not even try my fantasy uh, thrillers or my crime thrillers because they're like no nope, just not my thing. And they'll email me and they'll be like, I'm sorry, when are you putting another one out in that series? Because I'm not interested in the other one. This is, you know, you write women's fiction, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's unlikely that your women's fiction readers will cross over to my crime thriller series, for example, like Desecration. They're not going to do that. Yeah, no, but it doesn't happen. If, yeah, it doesn't happen. But if you write a book on, have you got a book on writing? I didn't know. It's in maybe oh, well, floating around in the back of my head. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, it's about time, isn't it? Yes, so it there is. you go. So, so you having a book on writing, me with all my books for authors, that we were uh, more likely to share an audience in that way mm. with um, helpful how to books which cross genres of fiction readers. So, but what I would say is the main reason to have nonfiction as an author is that it is much easier to market. It's really easy to market. I mean, seriously seriously, yeah. co compared to fiction, which is almost impossible. Um, and then it gives you a nice stream of income. You can turn it into multiple formats. So for example, uh, I narrate my own audiobooks for nonfiction, which is much cheaper um, to do than hiring a narrator, which we do for fiction. You can have workbook editions. Um, it sells really well in multiple editions. So I find people buy the audiobook and a hardback because they, oh, and the workbook. You know, people yeah. will send me photos and they've got multiple editions, which doesn't really happen with fiction either. So unless they're super super fans um so and then also non-fiction is more like a it doesn't really go up and down with what's in vogue in fiction yeah you know like right now is I, it, watching Bridgerton on Netflix you know, oh Bridgerton. yeah it's big out here too yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah it's huge so the yeah. Regency romance authors are like whoa this is yeah. a payday yeah. so they're all getting a massive bump of Regency romance off the back of Bridgerton but um I'm not I won't see the back of that with no, my coin thrillers <laughs> no exactly <laughs> <laughs> but so this is the thing it, you know you 
you with nonfiction, it's almost like you get a constant stream of money because there are always people looking for specific topics like how to write a book or for you and I, you have a podcast for writers. So do I. And there are always new listeners who are going to be interested in your book. So and a lot of fiction authors do nonfiction. So Neil Gaiman, for example, put out a book on Norse mythology. So the mythology underlying his fiction yeah uh, uh val mcdermott who's a crime writer here wrote a book about forensics you know underlying her oh, crime okay. thrillers so what i would say to fiction authors is look this is just another way to make a different stream of income and i th i think it's absolutely fantastic now i obviously have two names so i do non-fiction under joanna pen fiction under jf pen because i like to keep my audiences mm. um quite separate and i found that to be very very useful but i did the first three novels under Joanna Penn and then rebranded okay. years down the track so that's an, and that's another tip uh, is you nothing is set in stone if you own and control your rights because you can just change the name and upload a new version <laughs> yep easy <laughs> um your latest book Joe, is your author business plan uh, which I really want to talk to you about. And it condenses your extensive knowledge on how to make a living from your writing and from writing related activities, I guess, into one nice succinct book. Why do you think it's important that authors have a business plan? Well, it's only important if you want to run a business. <laughs> so that would, that, that, that's got to be the first question uh, to you as an author is, do you want to run a business? And this is not necessarily something that you can answer at the beginning with your book one, mm. because I feel like book one is the book of your heart that you, that's been sitting there for years and that you almost need to get out your system before you can even think about anything else. Um, so I, I would say that's quite important. Um, but what I think is if you want to make money, so a business makes money and it makes a profit. It doesn't last very long if it doesn't make a profit. Mm. So are you, is that what you want? And if you want to do that, then having a plan really helps because it means you can think strategically. We're not talking about editing commas and grammar. We are taking two big steps up above yeah. and we're saying strategically, what do I want with this business? You know, what is my production plan, which uh, I, I love talking about with authors. So, you know, uh, how do I create my finished product? What goes into my finished product? Things like my time and my research yeah. and then working with editors and cover designers and all of this type of thing. And then uh, what about my marketing? Because all businesses have to do marketing. What is the different types of marketing I could do and how will they work? What can I do that doesn't make me crazy? And what might I enjoy? Like podcasting for us. Mm. is uh you know we wouldn't do it if we didn't enjoy it yeah exactly and also, yeah it also sells books yay yeah. uh, and then yay <laughs> and then the uh financials obviously having a financial plan what i find with most authors who don't think about this in too much detail is that they believe the myth of the publishing industry i don't even know where this has come from but i had it um, which is I will write this book, it will make me a million dollars and then I will be able to retire. So I only need one book. Why are you even talking about writing more books? I only need the one and I'll be famous and rich and everything. And I thought that too, like literally that's what I thought. And when I got on a current affair, I thought I've made it. Yay, I'm, I'm here. Everything's, yep. yeah, everything's <laughs> going to change. And then it didn't. So we're not we're not going to wait to be anointed or have a lightning mm. strike we're just going to build a business with multiple streams of income that makes us money for the long term makes a living and so that's kind of why you would have a business plan is to help guide your journey and so the business plan I did back when I lived in Ipswich I still have a picture of the A2 poster oh, really? I made yeah for the wall it just had the creative pen in the middle and then it had these bubbles so it had ebooks and hilariously because i didn't know how things worked at the time it was like ebooks uh, and then a separate bubble get books on the phone <laughs> 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 so this was That's like great. 2000 yeah 2008 it's really funny and then it, it had things like speaking and teaching uh it had consulting so how do I help other people do this uh it had products um online courses you know and actually that just one a2 
sheet of paper or you can do it in your journal you don't need to write a 10 page document Mm. Um, in fact I would say do not write a 10 page document because it would be too much it's just to give you a direction to head in and also to kind of calm you down again a lot of the questions I get I'll be like someone will email me and say how do I use Amazon advertising and Facebook advertising to sell more books and I'm like okay so uh, how many books do you have oh I'm just writing my first novel and then I'm like, okay, just stop it. Stop right now and go and finish your book. Yeah, just write the book <laughs> like, first. Yeah. yeah, write the book first. And even, or just a first draft. If you can make it to the end of a first draft, you're going to be a lot further along the way. And if you can't make it to the end of a first draft, you never have to worry about Facebook marketing. <laughs> That's Correct. So I think this, uh, the idea of a plan, obviously my plan now is a lot different. I mean, it's got similar buckets of Mm. income, but it's quite different to the way it was. Uh, So for me, it's things like this year, it's sort of, you know, getting another box set out, um, you know, writing X number of books instead of finishing one book and, you know, this type of thing. It's it's much more developed, um, outsourcing, doing things that as your business matures, your plan changes. But um, having a plan just it, it just helps you with that strategic thinking. Time to sit down and think strategically rather than down in the minutiae, which is where a lot of authors spend their time. Mm, yeah, true. And the other thing, Joe, I wanted to ask you: a lot of authors, both trad, well, probably more trad, you know, because I've come from a trad background, and my last two books have been indie releases. But I know just talking to author friends, a lot of people feel very negative. I think that's the word to use about the whole marketing idea. You know, it's like I just want to write the books. I don't want to have to market anything. And I, I've just, from my observation, the last probably five years, even in traditional circles you know if you are trad published you still have to do marketing if you want to sell books so what would you say to people who might have a little bit of that sort of phobia or or negative attitude towards that whole idea of having to market as well as write the book well I mean you're right for if, if you even if you want a traditional publishing deal now they are going to ask you about your author platform and you know how are you re- how can you help us reach your readers mm. uh, and this is the crazy thing you know at the point at which you have a massive author platform you then start getting publishers coming to you because you are the one who can sell the books for them yeah. but um what I would say is first of all you need to reframe that as Uh, marketing is sharing what you love with people who want to hear about it. So for example, um, one of my best-selling books is How to Make a Living with Your Writing. And the reason that sells so well is because uh, people want to make a living with their writing. (laughs) It literally is a helpful book. And so that's a really good tip for nonfiction. It's like, what what do people actually want? And how can you help them get it? Um, And the same is true for fiction. So for example, your uh, women's fiction set in, uh, what what do you say? I wrote it down, Escape Worthy Places. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah, so people who want women's fiction in exciting places might want your book. So why is there a problem in telling them about it in a way that is not scammy or sucky or terrible? Mm. You're not going, buy my book, buy my book on Twitter or whatever. What you're doing is offering it to people who already are interested. This is why something like um, a podcast is great no one is forcing anyone to listen and anyone who is not interested has turned off by now or has not even started this episode or has not even you know sort of opted in for for this so what you're thinking with podcasting is with this interview we're trying to offer as much value to the Mm. listeners as possible and it's some of them might go on to buy my books buy your books and that will be we've made a sale now we might never know this this might be someone finds this in years to come we don't know how that will directly impact book sales but it doesn't matter because this is this is fun for us. We enjoy this. This is yeah. marketing, but it's also connection. It's being helpful, and let's face it, we like we like being helpful. <laughs> yeah, it makes us happy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So even if it doesn't sell any books, it doesn't matter because we're enjoying the conversation. And so that's what I would say to people: is think about your reader and think about being either being useful or inspirational, which is usually what nonfiction is about. So inspirational memoir, whatever, you know, self-help. And with fiction, it's how how do you uh, entertain people? And so 
it, reaching fiction readers, uh, for example, BookBub ads are something I do quite a lot of with my fiction. And it's like, if somebody enjoys a, a Dan Brown thriller, they're probably gonna enjoy my arcane thrillers. So I know I can advertise to people who like Dan Brown, for example. Mm. Um, or, uh, you know, d different things for different books or, you know, a Val McDermott reader might also enjoy my book, Desecration. Um, so it's thinking about the authors who people already like and then finding ways to reach those readers with fiction. And then, for example, my books and travel podcast is my books are also around sense of place uh, as, as yours mm. are. And so I was like, okay, well, if I talk to people about travels, then I might attract people who enjoy reading about different places. And so I kind of advertise my fiction that way too. So coming back to people who hate marketing, again, are you running a business? Do you care? If you don't care, then don't bother. Like mm. literally, if you don't, if you don't care about how many books you sell or how much money you make, then just opt out of marketing entirely. It doesn't matter. You're a writer, so write. Um, but if you do care, if you want to get your books into the hands of readers, if you want to make money, if you want to make a living with your writing, um, make six figures, make multi six figures, whatever you, your goal is, then you are going to have to learn this. <laughs> yes, yes. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but as we've said, I mean, hopefully people don't, you know think we're quite nice people and having a good chat and that this is this is a form of content marketing and this is what I've built my business on um blogging podcasting sharing things that are free to make you know it's pretty much free to podcast um you pay a small amount for podcast hosting and you know that kind of thing but putting out podcast episodes doing youtube videos doing social media doesn't have to cost you money and then obviously you can spend money do things like paid advertising advertising there's the number of ways to market your book is unlimited so mm. the goal is to find something that you enjoy and that is sustainable for the long term and then start doing it and slowly you will uh, attract readers uh, over time for example uh, I always say to people all right let's start easy uh, do you like taking photos you know on, on your phone Mm. Take one picture a day, one picture of something in your garden, your prop you've got a property in Australia. Yeah. What is normal to you is not normal to someone on the other side of the world. So how about, you know, have an Instagram or Twitter or whatever you Facebook, whatever you decide and share one picture a day from your phone and just start that way. It will be fun for you. It will be interesting. And it doesn't need to say anything about your book. What it does is start attracting people who might be interested in you. And then from there, they might be interested in your books. Mm. Yeah, it's about that creating those connections. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it does take, it takes time. I'm sorry, but it I does. mean, you know, this yeah. writing journey, this writing journey is not, it's not overnight success. It, it is a long-term thing, but then that's why you have to love it. You know, you exactly. have to, love, and I also say it's like any career, you know, I used to get paid the big bucks uh, because I was an IT consultant for 13 years and I didn't get paid that much year one or year two or year five you know I got paid that much because I had over a decade of experience mm. and that's how I feel about the writing career as well you, you are you can earn really good money this way but it's not in year one and it's probably not in year five but it might be year 10 and yeah. certainly you know for me it, it was pretty much it was nine years really for me to hit six figures and then you know, it, it, it's, it, it kind of went up from, from there. So, but it, I had by then like 20 books, I had, you know, podcast, I had an ecosystem. Yeah. So that's the way to think about it is that kind of longer term view. And then you won't go so stir crazy thinking, oh, I have to do all my book marketing this week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Think of the big picture. <laughs> do you, um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about is Elizabeth Gilbert in Big Magic has this idea that, um, you know, she actually says, I think in the book, something like, don't give up your day job, you know, keep your writing as your passion. Uh, otherwise, you you know, you could kill it if you something that you are trying to make money from. 
I think that that's probably something you may not agree with so much. Would, you, would that be right? <laughs> well, or? of course, of course, it's funny that she does that because, of course, she does make a living exactly. with her books. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. so, but no, I I love that. But I love Big Magic. I think. Um, yeah, me too. In fact, mm. in fact, Elizabeth Gilbert changed my life. Uh, Eat, Pray, Love was the book that enabled me to uh, stand with my happy choice of being child free. Uh, it was that okay. book that actually helped me um, make that decision actively and say, do you know yeah. what? I am really happy to make this life choice. Uh, so I will always love Elizabeth Gilbert for yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, that book, yes. So what I would say is, okay, I've got, you know, 30 plus books now and I am proud of them all, but I have no, I wouldn't say they're all my art. Mm. You know, I have a book called How to Market a Book that book is useful. It's very useful. It, I wrote it because I needed to learn. And then I update it. It's on its third edition now. You know, it, is that art? Yeah. It's part of my body of work. It's mm. an important part of my body of work. But w in terms of a book I'm very proud of, I've mentioned it, Desecration, that it was my fifth novel. It means so much to me. It is a deeply effective book for me. And perhaps that is the one, that's the book I found my voice. Um, but I would say that that series, uh, I still haven't found a voracious market for that series because yeah. it, it's, it spans so much, it's so cross genre that it's very difficult to advertise and uh, it has some darker themes. And there is so much of me in that book that I would say that book is art, mm. my art. Mm. And if you wanted to see inside the other side of my brain, <laughs> then yeah. desecration would be the book. But um, I, absolutely with Liz Gilbert there, there's no way I could live off um, that book. Or even Yeah, that's that, true. That, that's interesting, that isn't series. it? Yeah. yeah. So, And I've got I've have so many ideas for books and both fiction and nonfiction, memoir, um, travel stuff. You know, I have lots and lots of books that I'm going to write, but the definition of art and money sometimes you don't know I guess you don't know when you start a book so for example the successful author mindset also has a lot of me in it's got a lot of my journal entries um a lot of my mm. angst um, yeah it does you know, yeah. yeah exactly it's very personal and I would say that book is art for me because it's so personal um do you see what I mean I think yeah. what Liz Gilbert is saying is to respect the muse in a certain way mm. and to make your income streams other things so for example you teach you have um yes you have online courses you teach you do consulting that is related to your writing so i i include that in how to make a living with your writing includes speaking teaching most writers teach most novelists teach at universities courses yeah. whatever and you you do i i hope or maybe, I mean, that's not art, right? That's no, helping people. No, exactly. it's a different, that's... yeah, use of your writing and your skills, yeah. Exactly. So you could say that's part of my day job. Mm. Um, and in the same way, what I think with how to make a living with your writing and, and the different streams of income I have, I make money with affiliate income, for example. I do uh, tutorials on how to use Vellum software and that type yeah. of thing. It's not art, but it relates to my writing and it brings in income. So that's what I would say to people. You almost need this portfolio of income streams to mm. enable your art. But if you like, if you love your day job, for sure, keep your day job. Absolutely. But if you don't, as I was, did, did not, mm. I, I was so desperate to get out, then you have to construct a portfolio career that supports your art. And that's what you've done. And yeah. um, that's what I've done. And I think that is what most full-time creatives do. They will have multiple streams of income. Mm. Mm. Fantastic. What do you think is the biggest mistake or mistakes that authors make when it comes to, oh, we've, we've sort of talked about that really about making a living from the writing, but um, you have at the end, so let's talk a little bit more about your author business plan. You do have at the end of those chapters in the book um, questions for writers to ponder, you know, as they they pull this plan together, which I found really, really useful actually in, in looking at it myself and I'm only part way through, but it's it's something that, you know, you can keep going back to. But what would you be, what would you say are the three must do actions for an author wanting to make money from their writing in terms of having a business plan? 
Well, it, it is answer that question. Do I want to make money with my writing? Mm. So that's, that's the first one. And really being honest, people go, of course I do. But the answer, and Tony, in fact, Tony Robbins, you know, the great American yeah. self-help yeah. guru, uh, who I used to, you know, I still read, um, but did read back in 2006. I was reading a lot of Tony Robbins, listening to a lot of his stuff. And and he, he says, you know, what do you want to achieve? And then what are you willing to give to achieve it? Mm. Because you don't get something for nothing, right? So if you say, yes, I want to make money with my writing. Well, what are you going to do to achieve that? And um, that's going to be your time. So for example, you know, when I was, I did five years of the consulting job while building up my business as a writer and I would get up at 5 a.m. It's much easier to get up at 5 a.m. in Queensland. You are <laughs> True, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Particularly uh, this that, time of the year. It's nice yeah, and warm. <laughs> the, exactly. And you understand this. When I say this in England, people are like, what? I can't possibly get up that early because it's dark a lot, a lot more of the year. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I would get up and write between 5 a.m. And, and 6 a.m. And then I'd go to my day job and I'd come home. And in the evening, I would podcast, blog, connect with writers. And the weekends, I would work. And I basically, it was much easier to give up TV before Netflix. But, you know, we gave up TV for that is about, true. about four years. Um, and I worked on building... Uh, my what at the time was a side hustle and eventually became the mm. thing so that's the first question you know or two questions you know do you want to have a business or do you want to make a living with your writing and then what are you willing to do to achieve that and it's going to have to be as we talked about mind a mindset shift mm. around potentially from books that you sign contracts for that you don't even read to intellectual property assets that you own and control and understand how distribution and marketing and all these things work but the good things is you can learn these things but you have to have yeah. the attitude I am willing to learn and you know you and I both do this you mm. can learn this stuff it's like we didn't we weren't born knowing how to write novels we weren't born knowing how to podcast or do any of this stuff and so you just learn you learn the new things you need to learn um so those are probably the two biggest questions and uh, probably the third one is how much money do I want to make and what are the ways I could make that, especially in a time frame? So, for example, yes, you can make seven figures with one book, but it might take your entire lifetime for that number to actually yeah, add yeah. up. <laughs> um, so, how much do you want to make, and in what time frame? And then, what are the different things you could put together? Uh, to make that work. I mean, we haven't even gone really into detail in terms of, you know, the different formats, the different countries, um, you know, the number of books, uh, the number of t territories or countries, languages. Uh, you, if you take one manuscript, you really can make all these different things from, from one thing. And then if you add another book in there, it, it just keeps growing and growing mm. and growing. So, those are some questions for, for people to think about, but I, it does come down to shifting your mindset. It really does. And just as I'm talking to you and thinking about all the things that you do do, Jo, you, you must have a very organised sort of process too in terms of how much time you spend, for instance, you know, on your podcast each week and what, how much time you dedicate to your fiction writing and things like that. Are you a super organised person in, to, so you can get all those things done? <laughs> well, I, I guess I am pretty organized. Um, but what I would say is my overarching thing has not changed. So when I said I spent an hour in the morning creating, and then in the evening, I would do podcasting business learning courses, At weekends, I would do courses, you know, uh, that's still what I do. So in the mornings, I do creative work. Um, so, you know, we're talking in my morning, which I never normally do, but yeah, you're in Australia, yeah. um, but normally I get up and I'm working on whatever and I have a sticky note that only has one book title on and that's in front of me here and that's what I'm working on so um, that's what I do in the morning and then I will do some exercise or whatever and then in the afternoon I'll be doing uh, business stuff so marketing podcasting accounting all the yeah. emails all the things you have to do to run a business I do in the afternoon and that's literally how I run my life um, is mornings, creative work, afternoons, other stuff. And whether it's an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening or all day, then yeah. it, 
the principle still applies. You have, if you want to do this, you have to make the time for creating the, your body of work and you have to make the time to learn the skills and put them into action around the other side of things. So people listening, whatever time you do have, whether, you know, if it's half an hour a day, then fine, it has to be something you know, a book doesn't yeah. magically appear out of thin air and a business doesn't magically appear overnight. <laughs> Very true. Yeah. So that idea, like you would do if you were writing a novel, you know, a certain amount of time each day or a certain number of words each day, and then gradually mm. over a period of time, you you know, can end up with that finished novel. And it's the same, I guess, for any sort of aspect of the business as well. Yeah, exactly. And actually, it's funny, I'll mention um, year of the novel again. I remember that first day, I think there were 20 of us in the class and the teacher said, um, she, she actually said only one of you in this room will finish a novel. Like she actually said wow. that. And, yeah. But don't don't worry, because this is this year of the novel means that you can, uh, you know, expand your craft, blah, blah, blah. And I heard that and I was like, that's going to be me. Uh, and of course it, it was me and I finished it yeah. by November and hired an editor and all of that type of stuff. Um, but it's funny because uh, I really recommend doing something like year of the novel or year of nonfiction or whatever it is in order to give yourself some structure and deadlines mm. because, you know, I'm very adept at working with deadlines because I was a consultant and that's what we always, I always did that. Um, so I can manage my time to, to my own set deadlines. But if you're writing your first book or you're an indie author, you don't have have an external deadline yeah, exactly. but having a yeah. having a course where you go in what is it once a month you have a weekend or whatever and you, you have to have written this stuff by that date that can really help um certainly really helped me to get that novel done um in that in that first year so I definitely recommend having some kind of if you can external deadlines to get some of this stuff uh done yeah very helpful I'm, I'm a big one for deadlines so I'm useless without them <laughs> yeah me too but we have to set them ourselves right because you do, no one else you is do. gonna follow up a, well that's the thing like you say if you're an indie author you have to set your own deadlines and you've got to find some way of whether you have somebody else who's going to put a bit of pressure on you as well a, a writing friend or something like that where you're going to swap manuscripts at a certain time or you know if you do have trouble mm. setting your own deadlines I always find you know having that commitment to someone else where you know, okay, yeah, well, definitely. I'll have it to you by X date. That can help. But yeah, that you've got to come up with all these different ways of getting the work done. <laughs> um, Joe, one of the things I love about you is that you are constantly coming up with new ideas and evolving. And I know AI is a big interest of yours at the moment, artificial intelligence in terms of um, using that for, you know, recording books and things like that. But what is next for you in terms of your, your overall business, I guess, and your fiction? Uh, well, I mean, with my fiction, I just I just have so many ideas that I want to write. Um, I'm working on a, another arcane thriller, Day of the Martyr. So with fiction, it is just about writing the next book. Um, yeah. With my nonfiction, um, I am I'm working on how to make a living with your writing, the third edition. And as you say, what's so interesting to me is how things even the last edition was 2017. And a, there's a lot more opportunities. So for example, I've never done a Kickstarter, I've never done crowdfunding. Mm. And what I'm discovering with that is the incredible possibilities that there are with doing that. So I'm now really thinking about maybe doing some kind of Kickstarter for a book that I've been noodling for years, which I call the shadow book, which is writing from the dark side of of myself. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, uh, I have a second degree in psychology and I studied Carl Jung and the shadow. And I've been thinking about this for many, many years. And uh, I'm like, I just need the impetus to do it. So doing something like a Kickstarter would give me that deadline, that yeah. external deadline. I mean, I'm not saying I will do it, but as we're talking about it, I, it is something I'm considering. So in terms of my business, the other thing I'm looking at, as you mentioned, um, the world and technology is changing very fast and there are new possibilities for authors around, um, as you say, write it, writing with artificial intelligence, actually, as this, as we're recording this, I have a podcast episode that's gone out with an author who used AI tools to write his novel, um, which is traditionally published. Um, so that was even a couple of, a couple of years ago. Um, if people are interested in this sort of future stuff, um, thecreativepen.com forward slash future has a lot of my episodes. Um, and I've got a book obviously on artificial intelligence, blockchain and virtual worlds. And 
the reality is that in the last 15 years that I've been doing this, the world for authors has completely changed and the internet has revolutionized businesses and the pandemic has accelerated this change. Any business that did not have an online presence is really suffering. Mm. Um, less so over in Australia and New Zealand because you haven't been hit so hard, but in yeah. America, the UK and a lot of Europe and, you know, businesses literally that did not have an online presence have, have gone under. So this is going to continue to change the way things are. And there are some very exciting technologies that will help authors make even more money and do even more creative and wonderful things. So I, again, glass half full person, yeah. I'm looking at how we can do this and sharing on my podcast and with my audience, with my patrons on Patreon and, you know, sharing how we can use these technologies um, to expand creatively and financially. So I'm, it's funny, I have actually been a bit jaded um, the last few years because I felt like everything had was set in stone was kind yeah. of had stagnated and yeah. then the global pandemic hit and <laughs> just to shake things up a little bit <laughs> just, just to shake things up but it just shows you right how you think oh everything I all I, all I had in my head it's so funny was oh is this it now do I just write more books and publish them for the rest of my life and although part of me the artist it's fine with that. The other part of me, the entrepreneur was like, yeah. boring, you know, what's <laughs> next? <laughs> and so now it's like the artist is like, whoa, okay. And the, the businesswoman is like, oh, this is fantastic. There is so much going on. And so it's almost like, it's like 2010 all over again. It's like when the international Kindle came to Australia and if people are interested, or oh, I can send you the link in on YouTube. I still, my YouTube um, is hilarious. I started it in Australia. It's very old. And there's a video of me when I got the first international Kindle. I had it on pre-order. So it was one of the first people in oh. Australia to get the Kindle. And I'm like, and it's me in my house in Ipswich, you know, no makeup, just doing this thing. And I'm like, this, this is going to just change everything. This is going to mean I can publish to America. <laughs> and this is going to change authors' lives. You know, this was, this is a decade ago, more than a decade ago. And it has, it has changed authors' lives. And now I'm looking at a decade ahead, 20, by 2030, how will the industry mm. have changed again? And how can we make sure we're well positioned to make the most of this? And that's very exciting to me. And I realize for people listening, you might not be so excited. You might still be getting to grips with your first novel or uploading to Amazon or whatever. But uh, that's why I love to share my journey and yeah. will continue to as I take advantage of these technologies and then show you how to do it as well. Yes, leading the way. I love that. I'm definitely going to look up that YouTube video. <laughs> I'll send you a link. It is hilarious. I'm kind of embarrassed about it, but also kind of proud of it because I saw the future. <laughs> <laughs> well, Joe, the ebook of your author business plan has got a great list of downloadable templates. It's the books out in audiobook and print. Can you tell us where it's available and where people can find you online if they don't know already? <laughs> sure. Well, the creative pen, pen with a double N uh, dot com and uh, the creative pen podcast, the creative pen on YouTube. I'm the creative pen pretty much everywhere. Yep. Uh, and um, the books should be everywhere online. The books are sold. It's also should be you should be able to order it from your local independent bookstore as well, because it's in the Ingram catalog. Um, you might you should be able to get it at the library uh, as well. And right. you can also buy direct from me um, in ebook or audio, um, the creative pen dot com forward slash books all the links are there and if people have any questions um you can always tweet me at the creative pen um and i always like to to hear from people and uh, uh, australia will obviously always have a massive place in my heart um my husband i moved to australia from new zealand because i met my then wasn't a husband but i kind of followed him to australia yeah. <laughs> Oh, and okay, that's how I, you ended up here. Okay, from yeah, so New Zealand. We, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so yeah, we and we got married in Noosa. Um, so you know, and and because I did year of the novel there, because I started building my business there, I will always have a fun, yeah. love Australia for for that. So, um, I really want to encourage Australian authors and you know New Zealand authors to think much much bigger than mm. just the country you live in. I think feel like authors obsess about the country they live in but that's 
potentially less important than the rest of the world when it comes to book sales. So yeah, thanks so much for having me on. This has been fun. Oh, it's been a great chat. It's been so lovely to talk to you. And uh, yeah, I can highly recommend. I've read lots of your nonfiction books, Joe, and I find them really inspiring. So highly recommend them to any writers out there listening. Definitely look Thank them up. Thank you. And good luck with the whole lockdown situation. I just, I hope <laughs> that, you know, you're out and about soon and that um, things start to improve, obviously globally and, and also in the UK for you. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Bye. Bye.